Howdy friends, glad you could join us. As I was a-riding one morning for pleasure, I spied a cowpuncher a-riding along. His hat was throwed back and his spurs was a-jingling. As he approached he was singing this song. whoopie tie ya yo get along you little doggies, it's your misfortune and none of my own. whoopie tie ya yo Get along, you little doggies, you know that Wyoming will be your new home. Welcome to You Know That Wyoming Will Be Your New Home, brought to you by the Folk Arts Program of the Wyoming Arts Council. In this program, we'll go to the River Grove Ranch outside Burlington, Wyoming, to visit with Hugh Mahler, a rancher, horseman, and singer of old cowboy songs. I think everything I know is wrong. That's about all we ever did here, and that's kind of what we grew up with. And I think that's why I don't know them all today, because nobody then knew them. you just ride along, and everybody would be singing, and that's what you heard somebody sing. That's what you went home and memorized. And if he sang it wrong, you learned it wrong. And you never heard it enough to learn it right. And somebody, one of those bunkhouse pickers, if he had a guitar and could sing uh, Get Along Little Doggies, he's a heck of a hand. They'd, they'd book him on Saturday nights if they could. <laughs> Last night, as I lay on the prairie And I looked at the stars in the sky And wondered if ever a cowboy Could drift to the sweet by and by That isn't get along little doggies either, is it? When it comes to horses and cowboys and cowboy songs, there's not much that Hugh Mahler misses. In fact, he has ranched and rodeoed and worked with horses most of his life. So to understand a man like Hugh, you really have to spend some time with him in the corrals out back of his house. <laughs> that old mare there is an old racing thoroughbred. She's an old cribber. You see her standing there chewing all that pipe dab and old thing. It means that I can have a colt out of her. So I bred her this black horse last spring and I get the colt next year. The only reason I'm putting up with her, but she is a nice mare. I stuck her out here in this pasture and she tried to starve to death, so we brought her back in. <laughs> Go ahead. According to Hugh Mahler, the River Grove Ranch is about 40 miles from everywhere. About 40 miles north of Powell, 40 miles east of Cody, and 40 or so miles northwest of Warland, right smack dab in the middle of the Bighorn Basin. His family came over the Bighorn Mountains from Buffalo and got started in horses to supplement their farming. Although he's moved around some, Hugh Mahler ended up right back at home on the River Grove Ranch beneath Tatman Mountain. The trek from the barn to the corrals is short, but dusty. Grasshoppers shoot out from underfoot, and the late August grass is stubbly and brown. It's hot, and flies are everywhere. But this afternoon, Hugh has to brand three colts. He's joined by Gene Ball of the Yellowstone Institute and by producer Deborah Lamberton. So far, this summer's not been too good for Hugh. The horses are just now recovering from distemper. I'm so sick that I haven't been able to touch the dang thing. We finally got to where our time's run out, so I guess we'll give her a try. They're getting pretty healthy now, though. Wherever you got horses and congestion, there's lots of horses, and one of them gets anything, the whole herd gets it. It's like a bunch of cattle in a feedlot. One of them gets pink eye, and they all get it. And we had America come in here in March with distemper, and the whole herd got it. And boy, we've had a hell of a time shaking it. It just stays and stays. It's stubborn. If you get it right off the bat, you can combat it. Well, boy, if it gets a few days on you, why, it's tough. Then the problem we had with the, the breeding horses is it's real responsive to dexamycin, penicillin. But that affects their sterility with your stallions and your mares. So with the stuff we were going to breed, we couldn't give that. So we gave other medication, biomycin, teramycin, and, and it was stubborn to it. So we have to learn to be a veterinarian over the years. Yeah, yeah I guess. Well, we got a shoot around here. We'll poke these little buggers in. 
I'm heading for the last round Gonna saddle old pain for the last time and drive So long, old pal, it's time your tears were dry I'm heading for the last round Get along, little doggies, get along, get along Get along, little doggies, get along. Get along, little doggies, get along, get along, get along, little doggies, get along. I'm heading for the last round. Where do you usually sing that song, do you? <laughs> Most times I've sang it lately, it's been for funerals. To some of the old timers. I think the first time I ever sang one at a funeral was for Dale Pettitz. He was the cow foreman, the cow boss out to Hoodoo. And I think I sang Empty Saddles and uh, Heading for the Last Roundup. And I sang them both for uh, Bob Eisenberger, who was from uh, over Gillette Way, Steer Roper. I sang him at Graveside, I never will forget it. He had a Catholic funeral and they wouldn't let you sing things like that in the church. And it was snowing and blowing and we didn't know if we were going to make it from Buffalo over there or not, but we did. And uh, when it was over the funeral, why, the cemetery in Gillette sits up on top of a hill and half the procession got stuck down at the foot of the hill, including us, and then we had to walk up there. and. Uh, I sang both those songs for Eisenberger's funeral in a blizzard right by the grave. But Eisenberger wouldn't have had it any other way. He, that was the way he lived. He was a cowboy. The blizzard wasn't too tough for Eisenberger. He didn't bellyache about the conditions. We just reared back and sang it. That's the way it was. Empty saddles and the old Corral. Where do you ride tonight? If you'll only say I'm lonely and you'd carry me, old pal, empty saddles in the old corral. Empty saddles in the old corral. My tears would be dry tonight Are there rustlers on the border Or a band of Navajos Or are you heading for the Alamo Empty boots covered with dust Where do you walk tonight? Empty guns covered with rust Where do you talk tonight? Empty saddles in the old corral Where do you ride tonight? If you only say I'm lonely that you'd carry me old pal empty saddles in the old corral there's not many cowboys left I mean really true old hard tough cowboys like a few I knew and when I knew them, they were old and kind of fading away. We get here just a little bit too late to really get into what the really good old cowboys were. They'd uh, they'd go out in the spring cabin, and when it was over, they'd get together in, at Brandon, and then they'd gather yearlings, and then they'd go into dry cows, and then they'd go into the cow-calf end of it and go to weaning, and they had the home ranch cowboys and, and the old 
boys that lived outside in the winter time while they was out what they called raw hiding, working in thin cattle, kicking them into the boys at the ranch, and they just stayed outside. And they wanted it that way. They were uncomfortable around. When they went to town, they wanted to drink a little whiskey and have a little fun and go back to the hills. That was kind of the way they were. Kind of a bunch of loners. Special breed. Dying breed is too bad. I always said I thought a cowboy was a guy that could take her, if it was wet or cold or hot or whatever it was, and rope a wild cow off a bad horse going down a steep hill and come out at the bottom all in one piece. That's what I kind of thought they were. We've all grown up with our own ideas of what a cowboy was and is. Dennis Coelho is folklorist with the Wyoming Arts Council. I don't really think there ever was a golden age of cowboys. You know, as in many other traditional kinds of communities, the older members lament, of course, the passing of their friends and what they see as changes in their way of life. But if you look at the literature, you can see that uh, folks in ranching have been looking to some golden period in the past, even from the 1840s or perhaps even earlier. But there's been a constant process of change in ranching, changes in methods and in tools and skills, even in the language throughout this period, right on up to the present day. Now, in a sense, it is this change that makes the expressive forms like storytelling or poetry or the songs uh, so important because they're value statements about the, uh, the important things in the cowboy way of life. Now, in the case of the older material in the English language, uh, things like ballads and ballad fragments, most of that stuff was simply passed along from singer to singer. I think probably most of it came from cowboys coming through the country that had been someplace else. I, I know that these outside guys brought a lot of stuff in. They always said you show them a guy that rode in there with a neat bedroll and you never wanted to hire him because he'd been used to rolling it too often. You take somebody with a real old sloppy bedroll and you better hire him because you knew he'd only rolled her once in about the last 20 years. That's kind of the way it was with those boys in the music. Some of these old boys never got around enough to learn anything, but one of these guys with a neat bedroll would come in and he'd have a lot of songs because he'd been around a little more. Another source of songs were the uh, poems and verses that were published in, in cattle country newspapers, tabloids, and magazines. A good example of this is the tune uh, Tie and Knots in the Devil's Tale, which uh, started as a poem written in 1917 by Gail Gardner. It was so popular that it was set to uh, several different melodies in different parts of the country. It's also sometimes known by the name of the, the mountains in Arizona that are in the first line there, the, the Siree Peets. The cowboys always like this song, and uh, it goes like this. Away up high in the Siree Peaks where the yellow jack pines go tall. Buster Jigs and Sandy Bob had a roundup way last fall. However, old cow with long full ears didn't brush up by day. Got her lock ears chiseled and her old hide sizzled in a most artistic way. Said Buster Jigs to Sandy Bob as he throwed his long legs down. I'm tired of scorching, hiding hair, well, come on, let's jog to town. They saddled their ponies and hit out a lope, for it weren't no sight of a ride. And them was the days when a good cow poke could oil up his inside. Well, they landed down in the cowboy bar, drinking on a whiskey roll. They wound up tight sometime that night, some forty drinks below. Well, the bartender set them up one on the house, and they started the other way. And honest to God, to tell the truth, those boys got drunk that day. Well, they started out for the sorry peaks, packing an awful load. And who should they meet but the devil himself, just a prancing down the road. God dang you, ornery cowboy skunks, you better hunt you a hole. Cause I'm the devil from Hell's Rim Rocks out of gathering up cowboy souls. Well, the devil be damned, said Buster Jigs, we boys are a little tight. But before you crawl any cowboy souls, you're gonna have a hell of a fight. He took down his rope and he built a loop and he throwed her straight and through. He roped the devil by his painted horns and he took his dallies too. 
Now Sandy Bob was a lariat man with his gut line coiled up neat. He took down his rope and he built a loop and he roped the devil's hind feet. Well, they stretched him out and they built a fire while the irons grew sizzling hot. They sawed off his horns with a dehorn saw and they branded him up a lot. They tied ten knots in the old boy's tail and left him there for a joke. With a beller and a cough, they loped right off, necked up to a big black oak. If you're ever up in the Sirey Peaks and you hear an awful wail, you know darn well it's the devil himself crying about the knots in his tail. In the corral, Hugh has got one colt in the chute. Well, you suppose you could get a twitch on him? Probably not. Maybe. I think that iron's so hot I can just touch him with it and brand him. Let's try it. If one of the other ends is hot as this handle, it'll brand him. Whew. Well, he's branded. She's buckskin. The first colt is done, but there's two more in the small corral to get into the chute. Okay, if we can turn him out, we'll get another. Hugh is gentle with the colts and puts his denim jacket over their heads to keep them from seeing the iron. Nowadays, a propane burner takes the place of an open fire, and Hugh's tea brand heats up quickly as he primes the small tank. Okay. Got the handle of these irons hot. Woo. Got peas all over him. That was up. If I could just get the bottom of that, I got the top bit enough. Good. Next drawer. Your branding iron is a T. Yes, that's that mountain right back behind you, Tatman Mountain. And the ranch where this uh, used to be is the Tatman Ranch, which is just across the river. So that's the old Tatman brand. My father had it, and it'll be in the family a long time, I think. It's a pretty good brand. These one iron brands are getting pretty hard to get. I don't know how many brands they've got registered in the state of Wyoming, but. They must have a lot because the new brands are getting pretty complicated. A one iron brand uh, is all right to have now. I know a lot of these new brands here aren't one iron brands. It looks like they've been run into the truck when they heel over. Well, should we go do something else? You got that done. We just as well. Although Hugh Mahler uses modern equipment and methods in ranching, much of his work with the horses is the same as it's been for the last hundred years in this country. The cowboy songs that he chooses to sing reflect this continuity in work and lifestyle and harken back to the Victorian values of the mid to late 1800s. They're songs that deal with the lost comrade, the death of innocent children, courage in work and daily struggles, or loss of a true love. Many of these songs were in fact written from about 1910 on and include ones like Little Joe the Wrangler, That Silver-Haired Daddy of Mine, or another song that Gene Autry wrote in 1934 entitled Empty Cot in the Bunkhouse Tonight. There's an empty cot in the bunkhouse tonight There's a pinto's head hanging low his spurs and his shaps, they hang on the wall. Limpy's gone where the good cowboys go. He was riding the range last Saturday noon when a northerner started to blow. With his head on his chest, headed into the west, he was stopped by a cry soft and low. A crazy young calf 
had strayed from its mark and was lost in the snow and the cold. Limpy hobbled his feet, threw him over the horn, and he started again for the trail. Now the wind got cold and the snow piled high and poor Limpy he strayed from the trail. He arrived at three in the morning and put the dumb critter to bed. He rolled on his car Unable to move Next morning Poor Limpy was dead There's a range For all good cowboys Where the foreman Takes care of his own And Limpy will ride Old Pedro again up there on the range up above Where's the last place you sang these before you're singing them now? Taught this one I just sang to a girl to sing for a funeral at, <laughs> at Hyattville here about a year or two ago. And other than that, I don't know where I sang that last. It's been a long time ago. Well, the other thing that seems to be a real characteristic of uh, life out west is, is humor and there are tunes uh, like uh, Sorry Peaks that that have sort of a humorous character to them. Uh. I, I think of a poem that uh, to tell you kind of about the cowboy's humor it was kind of some of the old boys said he had a sense of humor was kind of warped when you hear a feller bragging that he never has been thrown there ain't been many horses that feller ever rode. Because if he ever was a cowboy, it's plumb safe to bet your stack and he's sometimes been a victim when a pony slipped his pack. He's been thrown right at the wagon when the whole crew laughed and smiled, and he's been dumped out in some canyon, and he's walked for several miles. He's been careless with his saddle since and let it get too slack, and when he felt his saddle slipping, when the pony slipped his pack... There was times when it was funny and it didn't even hurt. He just sort of lit a rolling when he landed in the dirt. And then again, there's times he thought he felt his spinal column crack because he'd landed hard and solid when the pony slipped his pack. Now, a man develops something with the passing of the years, and you could maybe call it caution, and it might be just plain fear. But he thinks back how he's suffered in a bunkhouse or a shack or getting over things that happened when a pony slipped his pack. I thought of that, the whole crew laughed and smiled. I don't think I ever got bucked off in my life when somebody was watching that he didn't laugh. And uh, I don't think I ever saw anybody get bucked off out in the hills that I didn't laugh. Unless it was one of my good colts, and then I wanted to cry because I thought I, I knew I was going to have to ride him again someday myself. Hugh Muller broke his first horse when he was 12 years old. He got paid five dollars, seven fifty for the next one, and he hasn't been away from horses since. How old is that little colt there? He's a yearling. He's probably a yearling in. Oh, I'd say, for, I don't know the dates, but it'd be May or June. He, he's just a yearling. And at the time we generally do this, what we're doing right now, we generally already get this done way long time ago, and these colts got sick, and you see that spot in his neck there under that halter where he just broke. And uh, we just haven't been able to do anything with him. I don't like to have to do this when it's hot and the flies are bad and everything, but these colts, you see, he's not concerned about this at all. That's, that's all right. Generally, they get hot, and, and then that's when they get mad, is when they start getting hot, and that's when you better go, if you don't know how to smoke cigarettes, you better go learn, because it's time to go smoke one. You get one of these thoroughbreds warmed up and get him fighting you, you just got to go quit for a while. 
Hugh calls out the second colt and stands in a corner of the corral. In his hands is a long, soft rope, which he tosses gently over the back, then the neck of the colt as it circles inside the fence. His wife and daughter watch, and soon the colt has calmed down and is ready to lead. That's the first time this colt's ever been touched. He just come, well, we've, what, it's been five, ten minutes, and he's leading and ready to come. These colts have got a lot of thoroughbred in them, and if you keep them cool, just as quiet as you can, they come real easy. And if you get them mad at you and get them fighting you, why then you just got to go someplace and butt your head against the wall and come back, because they're going to whip you out. And if you just do like this guy here, see, he's, he's cool and, and hasn't been stirred up hardly at all. Just mainly let them know you're not going to hurt them, and that's about all there is to it. When they do something right, let them know they did it right. And when they do something wrong, put them in a the bind. And in a way, these colts are just like a kid, though. They get to doing something wrong, and they'll capitalize on it. I always said you show me a guy riding a good horse and got a good dog faller, and even I'll show you fellas got good kids. <laughs> yeah. Home, home on the range Where the deer and the antelope play Where seldom is heard A discouraging word And the skies are not cloudy all That goes on for about four pages. Home on the range. Is that uh, where you're going to stay? <laughs> I suppose I haven't got enough money to get anywhere else. I guess I'll just stay there. I hope that's where they leave me. I don't want to be anywhere else. If I, if I died tomorrow and left behind every horse I got, I think somebody could get some good out of the sorriest one I got, because I think I raised some good horses. And... Uh, about all you get out of that, that's kind of like being a cowboy. About all you get out of it is the satisfaction, raising a good one. But if I had it to do over again, I'd just try to ride a better horse than everybody else, and I'd do the same thing, I think. You've been listening to rancher, horseman, and singer of cowboy songs, Hugh Mahler. This program is one in the series, You Know That Wyoming Will Be Your New Home, brought to you by the Folk Arts Program of the Wyoming Council on the Arts. The program was recorded, written, and produced by Deborah Jane Lamberton. Dennis Quaylo is Project Folklorist and Executive Producer for the series. Our thanks to Hugh and Mary Mahler of the River Grove Ranch near Burlington, Wyoming, to Gene Ball of the Yellowstone Institute, to the Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody, to Lewin and Associates, and to John Balber and Laramie County Community College. Mix engineer for this program is Dirk Fannensteel at Multivision Studios in Denver. I'm your host, Larry Peterson. Production of this program was made possible in part by a grant from the Folk Arts Program of the National Endowment for the Arts. <laughs>